Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Institute virtually. I, I would have it would have been even nicer to be there uh, in person, but uh, it, uh, another time. Uh, I will be giving today a short presentation of part of my research within this European Quran uh, project. I've entitled my talk for today, Picturing uh, the Quran. And I really am working, playing with both connotations of the word picturing, both imagining and visualizing, but also portraying uh, visually. So how did non-Muslim Europeans picture the Quran? Uh, sometimes as the Turkish Bible, uh, or as a law book for the Arab nation, or as a collection of lies fabricated by a cynical heresiarch. Uh, my research explores a number of these perceptions and portrayals of the Quran. But today I will focus on one hostile legend, and this is in the continuity of a book that I published in French in 2018 and then in English in 2019, uh, called The Faces of Muhammad on the History of Western Perceptions of the Prophet, uh, or in French, I called it Mahomet l'Européen, because I tried to show how much the figure of, of the prophet uh, was played an important role, has played an important role in European cultural history. And of course, in this book, I speak of the Quran and its reception, uh, including scholarly endeavors to translate and refute the Quran, uh, indeed, we had a conference in Barcelona last March on Robert of Ketton's 1142 Latin translation of the Quran, the first uh, full translation extant. Uh, and our conference will be published later this year as the first book in our UQ series, uh, series on the European Quran with de Greuter. But here I want to look at something uh, quite different than these scholarly uh, approaches to the Quran. I want to look at hostile legends about the genesis of the Quran. Uh, and I'll start with the uh, illustration, the cover illustration for the French edition of my book. Uh, Princeton University Press didn't want to put a, uh, an illustration uh, on the cover of my book for reasons that will probably be clear to, to everybody. Uh, but let's start here with a, a legend of a fake miracles of the bull and the book, the Quran, which was supposedly tied by the prophet Muhammad, false prophet Mahomet, to the horns of this bull. Uh, and we can start by looking at what Laurent de Premier Fait uh, says about this story. Uh, in 1409, when as a humanist at the court of French King Charles VI, he uh, translated Boccaccio's uh, uh, Boccaccio's De Cassibus Virorum Illustrium uh, in French and added some material of his own, uh, including a biographical sketch of the disloyal traitor Makomet, he says, whom he calls a false lying prophet and magician. Now, Makomet, uh, Laurent tells us, was born to plebeian parents in Mecca, where he worshiped idols as his family had before him. Uh, he became a merchant and traveled with his camels to Egypt and Judea, where he spoke with Jews and Christians, learning from them parts of the Old and New Testaments. He traveled to the pro province of Khorasan, where he sold spices and other goods to the powerful and rich lady Khadij. Uh, since he was an enchanter and sorcerer, he was able to seduce her and convince her that he was the Messiah, that is, the Son of God that the Jews awaited. Uh, so they were married, and Makomet's reputation spread, attracting Jews and Saracens from far and wide, says Lohan. Uh, Makomet, realizing that he could not become king of Khorasan, uh, feigned to be a prophet. And at this point, he was joined by a very famous priest. Uh, some people call him Sergius. This is based on the Bahira legend. Uh, exiled, says Lohan, in the Orient with his followers because the Pope had opposed him. On the advice of this priest, Makomet trained a dove to eat grains of wheat out of his ear. When the astounded people saw the dove landing on his shoulder and putting its beak in the false prophet's ear, he explained to them that this was the Holy Spirit come to speak to him as he had spoken to John the Baptist. Through this trick, he hoodwinked simple rustic people, says Lohan, who flocked to him in great numbers. Makomet goaded his followers onto war. 
the Arabs conquered large swathes of Persia and of Heraclius's empire. God, in order to show people the true nature of the traitor Makomet, struck him with epilepsy. Khadij was very perturbed. But Makomet was not so easily foiled. He explained that the Archangel Gabriel had come to speak to him and that he fell down because uh, he was awed by the brightness emanating from the celestial face of the angel. Makomet and the priest wrote laws mixing their own novelties with the items gleaned from Old and New Testaments. Uh, the book they wrote is, he explains, the vile and undignified Al-Quran. Makomet then placed this book on the horns of a bull that he had trained to eat from his hand. One day as he preached to the people, the bull suddenly appeared with the book attached to its horns. It was hailed as a divine messenger and the book revered as the word of God. Laurent says that he read all of this in book 24, Vincent of Beauvais' Miroir Historia, which is the Latin medieval French translation of Vincent's 13th century encyclopedic chronicle, the Speculum Historiale. Vincent had gathered his information on Macomet from various 12th century Latin texts. Some of the manuscripts of Laurent's work are lavishly illustrated, as we see here, uh, with this portrait of Mohammed preaching with the dove on his ear and the bull appearing uh, with the Quran on its horns. And we see a number of such uh, representations. Here's another uh, manuscript of Laurent's text with a similar image uh, with the bull appearing on the left with the Quran uh, on its horns. And uh, here we see uh, other examples from manuscripts from about the same time, uh, 15th century manuscripts, and, and thanks to my postdoc, uh, Florence Ninit, for finding these images. Uh, so one does not need to know anything about the contents of the Quran in order to denigrate it and dismiss it. These, the supposedly ridiculous means of revelation and transmission are enough to reassure the Christian reader that the Saracen holy book is a fraud. So what do pay the purveyors of these ridiculous stories uh, have to say about the contents of the Quran? Uh, they knew little to nothing about it, uh, but these earlier, the, the Latin authors who created these legends in the 12th century uh, affirmed that the essence of the Quran uh, was that it was an in inversion of the gospel. The false prophet proclaims whatever was prohibited shall now be permitted. In particular, God is said to grant sexual license to his people who are now encouraged to practice polygamy, fornication, and incest. This is, of course, as medieval fake news as I like to tell my students. Uh, news that, though uh, not based in any truth, uh, uh, is successful in denigrating and at the same time explaining Islam. Now, some of this is based on elements of Muslim history and tradition deformed under the hostile pen of Christian polemicists. The business about Gabriel, about uh, Muhammad having epilepsy, which is uh, derived uh, ultimately from uh, hadith descriptions of Muhammad being overwhelmed during uh, revelation. Other elements uh, of these legends are completely foreign uh, to the Muslim tradition, including the bull. Uh, the bull is sometimes a cow, and there's been speculation that uh, it comes from the title Al-Baqarah of the second surah. Uh, be that as it may, uh, these legends lived on well beyond the Middle Ages. Uh, Johann Israel de Brie and his brother, uh, Johann Theodor de Brie, published in 1597, uh, the Acts of Mehmed, Prince of the Saracens, uh, published in Latin and the same uh, year in German. Uh, they give a life of Mahomet, uh, of Mahomet, uh, followed by an account of the history of his successors, Arab, Mongol, and Turk, until 1596, and then a reassuring series of, uh, of uh, prophecies concerning the uh, imminent end of Ottoman rule. Now, the brothers debris regurgitate all of the standard medieval legends about Muhammad's fake miracles, including the bull with the Quran on his horns. 
Uh, and we see uh, in this illustration, the bull appearing twice. In the back on the right, uh, he's walking towards uh, Mahomet. And then in the center of the composition uh, is next to him. The illustration of these bogus miracles provided an easy means to ridicule uh, this false prophet and his law, as well as the Turks who follow it. In recounting the story of the bull, the authors proclaim, O oh, blindness, O oh, immense stupidity of the people. Now here we have the bull and dove scenes uh, in an engraving by Kaster, Kasper Leuken uh, from a Dutch tra translation of the Quran published in 1696. Now this Dutch translation was uh, translated not from Arabic directly, but uh, from André de Rie's 1647 French translation. Now de Rie was a serious scholar, an orientalist, a French diplomat to Alexandria and Constantinople, and uh, far be it from him to repeat the ridiculous legends of the dove and the bull. But the legends were still popular, and clearly the Dutch publishers felt that they added value to their endeavor. Again, we see how serious scholarship and fake news can reside together in the same book. Uh, a final example of this is the 1699 tract in German uh, by Johann Georg Pritz or Pritzius uh, called the Constantinopolitan or Turkish Church State, a title which shows uh, his Protestant association of Constantinople with Rome uh, the Muslim capital and the Catholic one, uh, and it contains a polemical life of the prophet. And here we see, again, uh, on the frontispiece, we have the Quran on a lectern of the bull who is, a, a, so we can assume has just delivered it, is standing by, and he's got uh, the dove, which is, looks more like a, a large chicken or something, on his shoulder and with a dark and ominous sky uh, in the background. So this 1699 illustration is the la last occurrence that I found of the bull and Quran legislation, uh, legend illustrated, uh, although I uh, will ask colleagues working in the 18th century to keep their eyes out uh, for more recent ones. But here we see how this medieval legend uh, created in the 12th century uh, found visual representations, particularly in the 14th and especially 15th centuries, and continued until uh, the very end of the 17th century. Uh, and in the 18th century, uh, we move on to something quite different. And here I'll close with George Sale's English translation of the Quran, which is the first European translation to present the Quran in non-polemical light. Uh, he presents Muhammad as a great monotheistic reformer uh, and Islam as purified monotheism uh, in uh, a trope that many Enlightenment authors of the uh, late 17th and 18th century uh, had. But this is another story, and I'm going to uh, stop there and let Mercedes Garcia Reynal uh, take the floor. Thank you.